<clears throat> okay, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on occupational management, the risks from, uh, from work-related stress. Uh, my name is Ben Pollard and I'll be looking after the technical aspect of this webinar. Uh, just a few points uh, before we get started today. On your screen, most likely located towards the top right hand side, you'll notice a small bar with some written words uh, located towards uh, the top. Um, <clears throat> one of these should say chat. If you have any technical issues and need to message me at any point, please click on the chat option and you can message me there. You'll also notice another option that says Q&A. If you have any questions for our speaker about his presentation at all, please click on the Q&A option and ask your questions here. We'll then go through and answer uh, any questions at various periods during the session. Uh, with all that said, uh, I'm pleased to welcome Peter Kelly, who is your speaker today. A technical expert on mental health and well-being and the prevention of work-related stress, Peter is a psychologist with the HSE and is here to talk about effective approaches to preventing and managing work-related stress. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Peter and I hope that you all enjoy the session. Uh, so Peter, over to you if you, want to, if you want to crack on with it. Thank you very much. Okay, Peter, I don't know whether you've unmuted yourself. Um, can't quite hear anything at the moment. So if you if you can unmute yourself, that'd be great. You. Okay, there you go. I can hear you now, Peter. Sorry about this, everyone. Uh, it's a brand new software that we're using. Uh, so there are probably likely to be a couple of bugs here and there. Okay, can every, uh, can you hear us now? Yep. Okay, yep, everyone ben, you? Uh, yep. Yeah, everyone should be able to hear you now, Peter. So, uh, so crack on, go ahead with it. Okay, well, welcome to this uh, stress webinar. Um, hope you're all enjoying this lovely summer weather. Very good for your health and well-being. Um, what we're going to look at today is work related to stress, uh, particularly the big questions that are out there. I'm just about to close the window because we've got a building site going on next door, so, which you might be able to hear. There we go. Okay, so we move on to the first slide. There'll be opportunities throughout to have uh, questions uh, as well. So we'll stop at different times where, uh, Ben, you can field some of those questions to me. Okay. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, Peter, just before we go on, it looks as though your slides still have, uh, you might need to close them and, and reopen them. They're still set on the uh, on the viewing slides rather than the actual slideshow itself. Okay. Right. We'll have a, another go. There you go. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. So, the slide might go down. Right. There we are. What is stress? Well, as you can see, HSC has its own definition. There are, there are actually hundreds of definitions of work-related stress out there. If you were to do a search on Google, you come up with a number of different definitions. For, for the purpose of HSC, in the context of work, it's the adverse reaction people have to excessive pressures or other types of demands placed on them. So it's not an illness but it can lead to physical and psychological damage to the, to the sufferer when it's sustained over a long period of time. Um, individuals may experience stress and symptoms of stress for short periods of time, and they'll quickly recover in, in most situations because it's not sustained, it's, it's, it's specific to a situation, um, and then they, they, they're able to recover quite quickly and, and carry on. However, there are, when the stress, the work-related stress in our lives becomes too much, this can lead to people obviously experiencing work-related stress and going off for a period of absence. Stress affects people in many different ways. Um, what stresses one individual may have no negative impact on someone else. However, what is true is that cumulatively, 
we will all have a point when there's too much stress and uh, actually the the part of what we're trying to do uh, within HSE and through the management standards which I'll talk about later is to control and moderate uh, the, the, your exposure to, to work related stress. <coughs> so work related stress is stress which is caused and this is important or aggravated by work, the work environment or the workplace. Uh, we all have stress at times during our life. We may have stress at home. We may have stress in our family. What we're talking about here is that type, that stress that comes from those work-related activities or work situations. It might be that you are experiencing personal stress and you come to work and that makes it difficult for you to do your work, which may lead you to experience work-related stress. Or it might be actually there is something about the way you're, you're working or the work environment that you're in that creates uh, the this sense of a lack of control and an, an inability to, to be able to manage what's in front of you. Work-related stress can occur when work is badly, badly planned, designed or managed. A number of you might have gone through change processes in work where you've experienced uh, sudden change without any consultation and you're left to do a completely different new role. You don't know what, what's expected of you and that leads you to feeling out of control and not able to, not able to, to look after uh, the issues that arise on a day-to-day -day level in your work. So what we, what we do know is poorly managed change is a fairly good indicator of work-related stress type symptoms six, 12 months down the road. Um, so in terms of looking at job things such as how jobs are designed are very important. Work-related stress is not really reportable and is unlikely to be really reportable <laughs> as stress um, as a is a symptom and not a condition. It's a sign you you experience stress and you might experience excessive stress, which would lead you to go to, to see your doctor. The doctor could either prescribe, say you've got work related stress with anxiety or depression, or that you're experiencing anxiety and depression. So certainly stress is present in anxiety and depression that might come because of the work that you're in. Um, but you could also just be experiencing work-related stress, but it's not by definition, therefore, a, a disease which would make it really reportable. We've uh, tried to address this over a number of years and we've constantly come back to uh, it being not really reportable. Because there are identifiable stressors, work-related stress can be prevented and managed. In the 1990s, there was a huge movement to teach people to cope with work-related stress. So you had a, a movement of people saying, you know, it's about how you think about it, it's about how you, how you effectively manage it. During that time, what we did see was an increase in work-related stress, not because people weren't coping, but actually weren't actually addressing the sources of stress. So potentially, uh, you could teach people to manage their their, their emotional resilience uh, and, and their sense of mindfulness. But if you're constantly putting them back into an environment which doesn't manage uh, them as individuals, you get a conflict between the two, the, the, two, the two people, the two situations. And I think this is something that I'd like to address a little bit later, because in, interestingly, over the last six years, I've seen a, a big move back into mindfulness and emotional resilience. And I haven't seen a corresponding dip in people's uh, in, in sickness absence uh, or in people's uh, ability to, to manage work related stress. Some people experience, uh, find the skills useful, but you, you have to do both emotional resilience, mindfulness and look at the work stresses to get the, the, the more round picture. Just doing one won't necessarily sort out the other. So it's important that you have both, which I'll talk to you about later. So what do we mean? Pressure versus stress versus mental health. The definition makes a clear distinction between pressure, which can motivate, and stress, which occurs when pressure becomes excessive and prolonged. There, uh, what someone once asked me is, is stress a new phenomenon? 
Uh, and there's a, a, a theory by Yerkes and Dobson's law, which talks about pressure, uh, where you have uh, burnout and rust out, and then you have pressure in the middle. And essentially, we all need pressure to, uh, to be able to be motivated to do our job. It can be equally, it can be equally as stressful being in a job where there's, where there's no pressure, as where there's too much pressure, you will then find that people begin to not able to cope and they move into this domain of experiencing work-related stress. So if you, if you think of a bell curve, what we're trying to do is to keep people in the middle. We want people to be sufficiently motivated by the pressure that, that they're under, but you don't want people to be over-pressure, over-pressurized, which leads them to feeling out of control. What we know is if stress is continuous, the individual does not have time to recover, and it can and does lead to, to physical and psychological damage. The Whitehall 2 studies, which were done in the 1990s um, and late 80s, uh, showed that uh, cardiovascular disease was associated to long-term exposure to work-related stress. Uh, so we have evidence to suggest that there are definite physiologic, uh, physical issues related to it. We know that people, when they're experiencing work-related stress, will often go to the doctor and then they report uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety as well. So there are definite, uh, there's a definite impact from being exposed continually, which, which needs to be addressed. Common mental health problems which are depression and anxiety, can be caused or worsened or aggravated by stress. I think we've covered this before, where I said that actually, if you, if you, if you do have symptoms of depression going into a, a work environment where there's, where there's substantial work-related work stress, this can potentially cause you to go off uh, sooner. Um, and equally, it can be the other way around that you know, the, the, the stresses that you're facing in work may lead you to uh, develop depression or, or anxiety uh, as an outcome of, uh, of the, the long-term exposure. So we know stress can lead to mental health problems and it's often, often it can be diff difficult to differentiate between the two, um, which requires you to, to see a doctor or, uh, or, or a, a counsellor who will be able to, to draw out what are the specific issues. What, what we do know is if you tackle work-related stress, then there is a knock-on effect on people's mental health. It promotes, it promotes positive mental health, uh, and that's really important. So in recognising stress, uh, you can see this cat on the, in, the, in the corner. Uh, not, doesn't look particularly happy, does he? Um, we have emotional symptoms, so people can become tearful, uh, sensitive to comments which they perhaps wouldn't have been sensitive to before. Uh, sometimes you see, you know, slight aggression, people responding aggressively to simple situations. Um, you can get um, mental symptoms, which is confused, uh, poor memory, people say, people feel, feel that they're slowing down, they're not able to remember things because they're not actually able to concentrate on, on, the, on the task at hand because there, there are a lot of other things going on uh, in, their, in, in their mind and in, at the time. Their behavioural moods, you get changes in mood swings, sometimes people being a little bit twitchy, arriving later, working long hours. I mean, if you look at this, you could probably all recognise elements of this in our own day-to-day -day work life. It's when it becomes a problem, however, is when all of these combine together and you've got no way out and you see yourself just stuck in this this cycle of, of you know of not being able to uh, to get out of the work related stress so the symptoms can vary they can be dependent on on different factors but essentially these are some of the things and if you look around an office uh, or where or you know someone think about someone who who's experiencing work related stress you'll recall that these were you might have seen elements of this in their behavior. As a line manager, you could be, begin to look for these types of symptoms uh, before the person goes off to allow, to allow you to have conversations with them. So what the important thing is to, is to help to recognize stress. We also know that stress can happen in teams. Uh, 
because if one or more has a problem, others feel they're not pulling their weight, they might be receiving preferential treatment. This stress can appear as disputes, staff leaving, more uh, sickness absence, poor performance. So there's a number of uh, different things that become obvious uh, as, you, uh, as a team begins to experience work-related stress. Again, thinking back to your own personal work experience, there the times when you when you as a team uh, have, have felt under stress. The, these would be some of the issues that would arise. The impact of stress. Well, stress has a significant impact on the individual and the team, as we've already described. It can be both physical and and also impacting their mental health. Uh, you can end up taking time off work, and in some situations people uh, could lose their jobs or may not be able to return back to work because of the, the, their level of um, the level of distress is, is high. Uh, particularly on a team, it can have a, a real uh, impact on your performance, make, make the team less effective. And also stress tends to spread. So you, you find other people in the team suddenly becoming coming or stressed or feeling work-related stress so that it moves around which makes it important that, uh, that, that, that we, we begin to address this, particularly if you're a line manager, because it will have a significant impact uh, on your ability to manage. Additional work, such as relocating work when people go off, the additional pressure both on, on your team and on you becomes evident, sickness, absence, performance issues. Um, it's interesting that when you talk to people who experience stress, they say, I mean, a line manager doesn't really understand. But when you talk to a line manager, they say, actually, my line manager doesn't understand. So actually, when we experience stress, there's a, a relationship with, it keeps going up and up and up. So although you at the bottom, you might feel, well, I'm at the bottom and my line manager's not experiencing stress, the line manager will be experiencing stress. The manager of the line manager will be experiencing stress. So what we need to do is basically, uh, attack it at an organizational level at all different levels to help the organization manage the impact of stress particularly on in the business there is costs due to sickness absence lost productivity you can if you take that for each individual that off with work related to stress the actual true cost is four times the salary cost that they're off with so if you've got an individual on thirty thousand pounds a year um, they've been off six uh, six months. Then you would say the the salary cost loss is fifteen thousand, but the true cost is sixty thousand. If you have a number of people off, it becomes very very expensive. So somebody might say, well, we've only got two people off. Well, actually, if you've got two people off for six months. You you you've probably got the you know near a hundred thousand uh, pounds, which has gone out of that business in terms of productivity and support and 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 that's sort of really that's something that people need to think about why it's important to do prevention rather than cure let's not wait till the person's become stressed but let's do something before I thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, to allow for some questions uh, it's in this cartoon just refers back to what I was saying I understand that life at the top is extremely stressful but if it makes you feel any better it's pretty stressful at the bottom as well uh, so just reinforcing the message that actually, you know, stress does rise and there's a need to tackle it at all different levels. Ben, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, there is uh, one question that we've had come through. Um, so this is from uh, from Sally. Uh, she has asked, uh, when there is a combination of personal and work-related stress, is there a certain percentage of work contribution that would mean that situation was defined as a, a case of work-related stress? Yeah, I think the, well, the the question is what you look at what's in, in the con what's happening in the work, and you say, well, is this is what is the work that's being done here reasonable? If somebody wasn't experiencing stress at, at home and they and they came back, would they would would they be able to do uh, do that do that level of work? So I think the the org the organisation needs to look at the amount of stress that's there. So if you've got one person who's experiencing 
work related stress and that might be related to the fact they've got personal things they still have a responsibility to do something so you couldn't put a categorical at 70 30 or at 60 40 it, it's really down it's down to the individual assessment of that person in the context of the work that they're doing um, so yes you do have personal stresses they will impact on work um, but that's not that's still not a reason to not do anything about it you know so I'd say, yeah, probably 60-40 if you have to put a figure on it. Okay. Um, there are two questions that uh, seem to relate to salary loss. Um, the first one from Karen, and that is um, how or why do you calculate the true cost as four times the salary? Uh, what did you use to measure this? Uh, do you have a reference for it at all? Yeah, we um, the Treasury... We're, uh, we had a, a, a piece of work done back in, uh, nine, uh, in 2006, looking at the cost of mental health to the, the UK economy. And at the time, um, we had statisticians and economists uh, there who, were, who basically look at the return to work cost, the training, the loss of productivity, the uh, rehabilitation cost, the, the need to train people up in, in a new role while the individuals are, and that, that figure came from, from them. So that, that was the figure that the Treasury gave that they estimate that it's four times whatever the cost is. Um, now, if you've got an organisation um, that has, say, a, a, a 500,000 pound turnover, but you've got a few, you, you have two, two people off in there, then that's a that starts to make a, a significant uh, reason for why you need to you, you need to invest in uh, in doing prevention. Uh, I, I think a really good example was a study that was done, which is on, you can find on our web page, which was done with the Somerset County Council, where the actual uh, intervention, which was to teach. A, a range of managers and individuals how to manage work related stress and to make changes in the work environment cost about two hundred thousand pounds to for, to to do with five to spread across the council which had five thousand people in but within 12 months it, it saved 1.5 million pounds so the actual the it it, it, it recovered it the its uh, cost of doing the intervention within a couple of months of, uh, of it being in place. So uh, certainly interventions, whilst, um, whilst it on appearance may look expensive, the cost benefits of the interventions right are, are usually quite sub substantial. So West, that would be our, on our website and that's the Somerset County Council. Okay, next one. Okay, uh, that's actually um, it's all, all the questions so far uh, relating to the presentation. Uh, there's just one more that I'm answering myself uh, in writing, but uh, it's more related to CPD. So uh, if you want to continue, um, it doesn't look like we've got any more coming in at, at the moment in time. Okay. So what do, we, what do we know about providing support? Well, how do you provide support to individuals? There are various ways that to support people experiencing stress. Um, there are training courses that give various skills to reduce the impact that stress might have on you, mindfulness and resilience. Uh, you could have additional support from training where the pressure comes from a lack of knowledge or skills, mentoring and buddy systems. Uh, but really, I think the thing thing is make sure everyone is, has a clear understanding of their role. Make sure they know what their team's priority is and they feel a part of what's, what's happening. Um, then that will that will help. And at an individual level, people need to feel that they want to belong uh, in a team a team situation. In improving the integration of the team, promoting social and team events, and celebrating a job well done, all of these can really help. It's funny because people say, "Well, um, what's the one thing I can do that would make a difference?" And I said, "What are you doing to me now?" I said, well, "I'm talking to you." And I said, "Yes." So actually. Having conversations with somebody, uh, it doesn't require a management degree. It doesn't require any level of, of uh, qualification. It just has, it requires you to sit down and listen to what people are saying. And, and often if a person's experiencing work-related stress, 
what they really want you to do is for you to ask the question, oh, is there anything we can do? Oh, I've seen, you know, they're looking for opportunities for someone to ask them how they can, how they can become, um, how they can get over the obstacle that they find in front of me. Uh, and actually, what does it cost to tell someone that you did a good piece of work there? I bet you all, you can all remember the times when you were told you'd done a, a good piece of work and less likely to remember the times when you've been told you've done a bad piece of work because actually it felt good. It felt, I felt valued for what I was doing. Um, so I think there's something important in that and it's, and, and it makes people respond well. So support the individual by the issues that we've, we've done there. You know, you might choose mindfulness, you may choose resilience, uh, as well that's perfectly okay uh, in supporting the individual but don't just stop here don't stop at the individual you need to, to work your way about the individual and the organization together and I think that's important um, and it's important that we realize uh, that we're all in this together and it is both organizational individual coming together that, that can get on top of the uh, the issues of work-related stress. So what about prevention? So in terms of support, ensure you regularly discuss pressure and workload in your team meetings. Enough people tell you where it's going wrong because they'll, they'll meet in the canteen or they'll meet around the coffee area or in the kitchen saying, oh, this is bad and that's it. Why not turn those around? Why not actually think, okay, We've got an issue here. What can we do? How can we sort it? In most of my involvement with organizations, the conversations haven't been had. The problems have been acknowledged, but the conversation hasn't been had between the employer and the employee because they've not known where to start. But really, starting the conversations and, and looking at, if you know you've got pressure points in work, if you know you've got excessive workloads, work with the team to manage those. If you know bottlenecks are coming up, agree a way to tackle them uh, with your team. Don't impose your, what, your solution if you haven't got them, your team to buy in with you. It's, it's, it's usually important that they are part of the agreement process to, to tackling these bottlenecks. The obvious one here is consider and discuss changes before making them. You know, bring your people with you on change and it works. Don't bring your people with you on change and it doesn't work because people feel um, that, uh, that it's just being forced upon them. Make sure everyone uh, has a clear understanding of their role uh, and know what their team priorities are. I think that's also, you know, massively important. Um, what happens when we have changes, we lose a sense of our, our identity and what, what we do in work and why do we feel um, why do we actually feel that we're not under control? And control is dead important here. Uh, how many of us want to go into work and, and be able to control the workload, to control what's happening? It's fundamental. Um, if you were to ask someone, what, what, do you, what would you have, the freedom or the ability to control freedom? It would, be the, it would be the ability to control freedom because you need to feel as though you have some level of, uh, of direction, that you're in charge of what's happening, rather than it taking you forward. When people experience work-related stress, the lack of control creates that, that, that anxiety. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get, get control here. So preventions are simple, uh, and the, the, we're not looking at spending 100,000, 200,000 here. We're simply saying, talk to your people, look at, your teams often your teams have the solutions to your problem it's about you and the org it's about you the employee and the employer working together to to form solutions and another question set uh, yeah we've got a few questions uh, so the first one here um, can, can, I, can I just refer you to that fish in the top left hand corner there yeah go for it yeah. No, this is uh, this is my goldfish. Well, not my goldfish, but in the blender. But uh, I thought I thought there was stress in your life. But anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, right. Um, so the first question here is: uh, How do you convince your organisation to invest in preventative measures? Well, you go and look at how much they're spending on uh, rehabilitation and return to work. 
and then you say, okay, so if the, if the people are off and we're losing this much money and, and we can do uh, an intervention that's going to cost a third of what you're already losing, then that, ten, that tends to work with organisations. It's the business case, isn't it? You want people to be effective and you want them back in work. So if prevention is about, uh, the whole reason we do prevention is to keep people in work, to keep them sustained in a happy and healthy work environment, the benefits to the organisation are that you don't end up going to tribunals and, and, you know, and, and, and other areas because you've, you've, you've tackled it. At, a, at an early stage, uh, so it's 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 a number of ways. I always sometimes I sit down with a a, com a, a company directors and I'll, and I'll I'll present the business case. Here's what it's costing it. Here's what you can save. If I'm talking with employees, I'll talk about this is what the employer should be doing to uh, to to work with you and to support you. If it's with line managers, I tell them. If you do this, the benefits of prevention are you'll be, you'll be able to manage better and manage people within the context of your work better. Uh, if it's trade unions, I would say this works with the you know this works with the trade union values, which is to trying to improve the workplace. So you, you've got to look at the, the the people you're trying to convince and challenge change your message uh, to to address what they specifically want. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to do here is to make workplaces healthier uh, and and better. What we're not trying to do is eradicate work-related stress. We don't eradicate stress because it's not possible. What we're doing is to reduce it and to try and control it. Uh, so I just I think that's a, often important is that you want to get completely rid of it. Actually, the, that the reality is stress will be there. It's how it's controlled that's important. So. I kind of being a civil servant, I've given a long-winded answer to that, but it's it's it really is about identifying the group and then targeting your message. Next one, Ben. Okay, brilliant. Um, if stress is not a reportable condition, how do organisations identify rates of work-related stress uh, as reasons for absence don't always reflect that stress is an issue? Well, you can look at surrogate measures of, of stress. So uh, people that maybe are, who are not reporting work-related stress um, will, will go off with short-term absence normally related to, uh, to physical conditions. Can you still hear me? I've had to put the fan on because it's awfully warm in this room. So, but as long as you can still hear me, that's fine. Um, everything seems to be fine. I'll, I'll let you know if, uh, if it changes, but everything seems to be fine. Okay. Um, so yes, it's, uh, ask the question again, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, so, so the, uh, the question, let me just, uh, remind myself as well. Um, if stress is not a reportable condition, how do organizations identify rates of work related stress uh, as reasons for absence don't always reflect that stress is an issue? Okay. Well, I think I've covered a little bit, which is about actually there are surrogate sicknesses which which happen, uh, but you can also begin to you can begin to identify it through changes in productivity or systems or and in general line management responsibility as well or supervisors um, that they they can begin to ask questions where they see a dip or a change in performance. Uh, there are when people have gone off with work related stress. Often team members or line managers say, "Well, I did see something, but I didn't quite. I didn't. I didn't really ask the question. I didn't know what what was, you know." And I think the important thing is, is that asking the question which helps you to identify it. Uh, sometimes it's uh, it's self it's self explanatory, you know, and and, and you know, the use of people find out. Okay. Okay, great. Um, someone here. Sorry, obvious, obviously, exit interviews, um, as well as uh, which, which, which would be useful as well. Right. Okay. Um, there's also someone. Uh, first of all, has uh, said thank you. It's a very interesting seminar, which is very nice. Uh, they've asked, uh, could you elaborate on what one does to increase one's stress resilience? Well, yeah, at an individual level or at, at an organisational, I think it's, it's interesting this one because. Um, 
I believe, or I believe that you can, individual resilience um, is is achieved by realizing what your capabilities are and how far you know you're able to work. Do you think about uh, the situations that you're in, uh, and that helps you to manage those better because you, you you're aware of how your mood might change and that impacts on your your productivity. Uh, so. I think that though you, if you focus on the on the internal things that are going on in your mind as you face stressful situations, then developing resilient skills around those to recognise, okay, things are a little bit out of control here. I need to draw my experience back here, do something different. However, I think they can't be in the absence of something else going on within the organisation. You know, there's this term now, organisational resilience. So what we're saying is that actually. It isn't just the individual, it's the organization that also has to adapt and change and understand its own behavior and how its behavior impacts on the people that work within it. Uh, so you can look at a number of different skills that you can develop for resilience and also for mindfulness and they, they will help people as individuals in some cases uh, to manage the situation that they're in. Uh, there is less evidence to, to suggest that if people are constantly in that sustained evidence, that people who are emotionally resilient and mindful won't necessarily go off for work-related stress. The reality is um, eventually the body and the mind will go, that's it, this is just too much. Even if we've got, if we are emotionally resilient and we are mindful, the, we, we can only take a certain level. Um, it might be that you stay in work a lot longer because you have those skills. But at some point, if the work's not changing and adapting itself, it's just simply putting out more and more pressure. And so the pressure cooker goes off. Next one. Okay. Um, so uh, this one, uh, is stress accepted as a diagnosis by the HSE or is it seen a, as a causation of depression and anxiety? No, it, uh, well it's not even accepted by the DSM-4 which is the criteria for, um, sorry DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Mental Health, for health Conditions, so it's not recognised uh, as a disease is recognized as a, a, a symptom. Um, and in most cases, if you were to see a GP suffering with work-related stress, the GP would indicate that you're uh, are experiencing symptoms of depression. So when you are feeling work-related stress, those, those symptoms are, are very are the same as and similar to depression, or in some cases, anxiety. So if you're going into work and you're getting really, really tense, tight feeling in your chest, you're sweating, um, and you're, you're you're just running between jobs and, you, and you're not able to make a decision, if you, uh, and it's disturbing your sleep, you're going home, you're not able, you're, you're suddenly scared of things that you weren't scared of before, then the GP is going to go, you've got anxiety um, because that's a, diagnose, that's a condition by the DSM-4 and he will treat you for anxiety. But your anxiety could be directly related to the fact that you're under extreme pressure at work and that's how the, how the work-related stress has come out. So not a reportable condition because it's a sign, um, but it is definitely part of, can be very much a part of depression and anxiety. Okay, great. Um, do you want? To, there's a few more questions still to answer. Do you want to continue with the the questions? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Sure. What time have we got, sir? Uh, we've got. Well, the webinar is open until half past one. Um, I think I've probably got about ten more minutes of slides, so that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so the next question then uh, is: um, Have you any tips on increasing uptake of exit interviews? <laughs> yeah, offer them a prize. No, I, I joke. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, exit interviews can just be part of the organization's uh, standard procedure for leaving. If you make it the procedure that when an individual is leaving that you do exit interviews and that, so it, it's expected as part of, uh, of employment practice. Um, you, if it's not part of your employment practice, you can request it and an individual can, uh, can, 
can say, well, I'm not prepared to do an exit interview and you have to respect that. Um, a good organization would want to know why someone's leaving uh, and as uncomfortable as that might be, it, it's best to have that conversation because let's, let's have the hy hy hypothetically, you've got a team of 12 people, three people have left within uh, the last three months. Um, you, would, you would want to know from a team of 12, why have a quarter left? So it would, the organization should be then thinking, I need to find out, I need to do these exit interviews. And it might be through those exit interviews, they identify actually there's some difficulties with the team there or with the, with the workload or there's some relationship issues with the line manager. So make it part of your procedure, I, I suspect. If you want to do it, just say, if someone is leaving the organization, we will do an exit interview. Uh, if they choose not to have that, then there's not a lot you can do. In my experience, when people are leaving, they're very keen to tell you what the issues were. So it would be, um, it's often they can't wait to tell you rather than, um, than, than not tell you. There you go. Okay, brilliant. Um, so someone's asked, uh, which division within an organization should take the lead in tackling work-related stress? So HR, occupational health, or health and safety? Isn't this the, uh, the million dollar question? Um, I think it's whoever's best fix to address the issues. So if HR can, uh, can take on the mantra of tackling work-related stress and put the resources in and have the connections on the shop floor, then it's HR. If it's more like that health and safety is, is better equipped to do it, then you choose health and safety. Uh, so and it, it's really about the, the risk assessment as well. If you're doing a risk assessment, who's qualified to do that? Is the, is the person in HR qualified to do it? May, maybe not one of their strengths, but um, it could be, uh, you know, it could be that uh, the health and safety person. But ideally, all of them in, in, in it could potentially do it, couldn't they? Um, it's where the organization decides to pitch the idea that they're going to tackle work load of stress that can determine, um, that very often determines where it sits. I've, I've dealt with some really good health and safety people. I've dealt with some really good uh, HR people and I've dealt with some, and, and I've dealt with a, a number of different uh, uni people, uh, a sort of um, union, unionized organization. The other thing is you can have working groups as well. So where you bring them all together and say right, at HR level, you've got a HR, health and safety and a union person together, which would lead me nicely into the next section. And I'll come back to the other questions, Ben, where we talk about the management standards. So I do that and that might help to answer that question. Okay, brilliant, that's fine, yep. Okay, so, um, our management standards, which we developed uh, back in 2000, released in 2004, uh, now over uh, 12 years old, um, they uh, were looking at six areas, demands, control, support, role, relationship, support, and change. What we are looking at are six characteristics of work, which if they're managed, then you will be able to reduce work-related stress within your organization. Um, how many of these do employees, employees have direct involvement with, and then how many can you affect for their team? So the following slides detail possible interventions, so which, which, which is what we're gonna go through. But these are the six areas. In answer to the previous question, once you start looking at this area, these, these begin to help. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these. You've got the slides, and I think um, the slides are gonna be made available, aren't they, Ben? Yes, that's correct. We'll make them available for everyone after the session. They'll be emailed out. Okay, in PDF format. And at the bottom, there's, there's, um, there's, a, there's a set of uh, instructions of notes as well for people to have a look at. Um, it was an attempt to try and keep me on track, but uh, I, tend to, I tend to slightly go off, off and talk about things that interest me because I, I obviously am quite passionate about the area of work-related stress. But the, the, this, the notes are really useful and we've developed those specifically so you could take them away. But things like demands, you know, you, you might want to consider developing personal work plans, uh, looking at people's competency, implementing development and training plans to help them to, to, to manage the, the demands of their work. 
promote a system where employees are not contacted electronically outside the working hours. Do you know what? Businesses don't collapse if you don't have your mobile phone with you um, or that you don't enter an email at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, companies in, in Europe, particularly a, a Volkswagen, I think it was Daimler or Volkswagen, they switch off their email at seven o'clock at night on the weekend and staff are not able to access it until Sunday uh, at 12 o'clock when it comes back on. The, the, the company functions effectively and actually uh, employees talk about saying that they, they, they feel they get better quality time with their family. Um, we never we never bought into a 27, 24-7 work culture, but we now have it because we need to put some personal responsibilities in there to allowing people to manage electronic, you know, phones, emails, etc. Look at the providing physical, you know, you've got physical environment and, and potentially incidents of violence. You've got to make sure risk assessments are identifying the hazards. So there's some of the positive things, amongst other things which are there, which you can have a look at. Communications just goes all the way through this. Talk, 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 and then listen, and then talk, and then listen. So the important thing is you're having a two-way conversation uh, when you're tackling this, these issues. Under control, make sure staff have a say over the way their work is organized. Don't just say, this is how you're doing it, and then say that's the way it's going to be done. Because in most cases, that causes conflict. If you design the workplace with, the, with, with your individual, then they're more likely to, to do to do things in a more better way. Do team members believe they're able to use their skills to good effect? How else uh, would they like to use them? Let them feel a part of the solution. Um, allocate responsibility to teams rather than individuals. Again, spread the load. Make sure people feel that they that they're all they all have a buy into controlling the issue. And support. Hold regular one to one meetings. Uh, introduce flexibility in work schedules, tell people about sources of support which is there. Now everything we've provided here doesn't cost you a monumental amount of money. It's about changing the way you work and changing about your interactions with, between employee and employer and I think that's really, really important because um, people say, oh, I can't afford to do the interventions. I say, well, you actually, you can't afford not to do the interventions because you're already losing money. By doing these small uh, things here, by giving people a sense of ownership of their workplace and a, and a, and a, and a connection with, with sorting out solutions, you get you 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 get increased product, you know increased support and product. People become more productive and want to work. So uh, we've looked at these things and we've intentionally not put anything in there that's massively expensive. Ensure under your role, ensure people know what they do and they're clear about their role. Um, display team targets, develop suitable inductions. When you when you're at a party and somebody says to you, "My, what's your you know what's your name and what do you do?" People say, "I would say my name is Peter. I'm a psychologist, okay, or I'm a health and safety professional." The word "I'm" is dead important here because you identify yourself with the role and the work that you do. So actually getting the role right and getting people's uh, acceptance of the role is really, really useful. Uh, people don't say, or some people do say, I work for, uh, but most people, and, you, and you'll, you'll probably go to loads of parties now and you'll, you'll observe this, will they'll associate themselves with the job that they're doing. Um, now if you've got problems with role, then that creates difficulties for people and you know because we want to know what we're doing we want to feel valued knowing what our role is helps us to do that positive action for change change is the gonna happen all the time we can't avoid change change is part of businesses and organization growing and develop what we can do is just make it a lot more friendly for staff to, to, to be involved in that process, to let them see why the change is necessary, to agree methods of communication and frequency, uh, to review unit individual work plans, you know, to make sure people feel that they that they know what's coming and how they can manage it. Uh, all of these are simple things that are just not always present in, in change management. Uh, where, and that's why if they are present in change management, they work. 
if people feel they know what why they're changing and the reasons why they're changing, they'll do it and they'll come with you. But if they don't, then they'll struggle against it. Relationships are massively important. When you can't, you go to work, um, this will scare some of you, but you actually spend 40% of your uh, life will be spent in work, 40% will be spent to sleep, and 20% will be spent with your family. So it's very important that you get your relationships right because these people that are around you at the moment, you're going to see more than you're going to see your family. So uh, for some of you, that might be a good thing. For others, it might not. Um, so I would rather have the other way. I'd rather have 40% with my family. Uh, you know, so I think the important thing here is getting relationships right is really, really important. We can all think of a time when we've had a difficult relation at work and how draining that is. So we have to work at relationships. We have to say to people, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable behavior in, in the context of work. We need to encourage good communication across the team. We need to identify ways of celebrating success, lunches, wash-ups, you know, at the end of the meeting, going up to somebody and saying, that was a brilliant job. Uh, and I've, I've seen that on a, on a number of line managers that we work with, and they've gone up and just said, oh, I really appreciate what you did there. And it's changed that relationship very much. And it's both ways. Tell your boss he's doing a good job if he is doing a good job. Um, I tell my boss all the time he's doing a good job, uh, so uh, which, is, which, uh, which is probably a good thing. Um, support that's available. We're coming to the end shortly. Uh, so there's the internal HR, occupational health, uh, employee assistance programs. There's external support through ourselves, ACAS, and uh, the EHRC and EAS on advice and equality and equal rights. Just search them under Google, you'll find this information. So support is there to help individuals, to help the organization. Um, and this leads me on to the last, uh, that's my last slide, and now it's questions. And it's over to you, Ben. Okay, great. So uh, picking up from earlier, um, there was a question here. Um, <clears throat> is there a good format you can use for uh, using as a return to work? Well, I'm biased here. Because I did, I did produce a on HSE's website. Website, there's a return to work questionnaire. Um, essentially, it's the it's the management standards questions uh, slanted to asking them for people who are returning to work. And what it allows you to do is to build a um, a case study of what needs to be in place to allow that person to be back in work. But what you need to know is. When that person's coming back to work, what is it I need to do to keep them in work and sustain them? Now, there's going to be a period when they're coming back to work where they're going to need to be have, have reduced workload and reduced hours to bring them back in effectively. And that needs to be agreed up front. In most cases, that's about four to six weeks of uh, on a phased return, which allows people to get back into work. If you're going to put people back into exactly the same situation that caused them work-related stress in the first place, then there's a high probability once they've returned to work and that phase return has disappeared that they'll go back off again because you've not addressed what the issues are organizationally that created that potential problem. So the organization has a duty to, to you know, would be wise to try and change those, those issues that were there. Uh, so you could use the structure return to, return to work questionnaire that I put in but on the uh, HSC website, where it's under, uh, I think it's under resources, uh, under the management standards, so that's one way. Or, you know, look at the user occupational health provider as well to, to plan a phase return to work. But remember, people who have experienced depression and anxiety are susceptible for a period after they return to work because emotionally it takes a while for the, the, the body to become fully, fully repaired and, and running at a hundred percent again. Lots of questions that, by, by the looks of it. Definitely. Um, okay, another one here. Um, is it correct? I, I think it must be boring people. People are disappearing. <laughs> Well, I suppose we're coming to the end, so it's possible that people have to leave. But we, you know, we, we've still got a fair few people in, so we'll, we will okay. continue to go on. Um, is it correct that the HSE are revising the stress standards and will be visiting organisations to see how they have implemented the current standards? 
we're not revising the standards. What we're doing is re-engagement is the, is the word. So for a period of time up till 2009, we were very active uh, with, with work related stress. Um, and we, we, at 2009, we took a back seat and said, we'll leave people to, uh, to carry on with the work we were doing with the management standards uh, and to, uh, to sort of, to, to say we've done what we need to do, let's, let's just, um, let's see people using it. And the one thing we realized is actually, with us not being proactive, people are less, less likely to be using it. So the decision was made to come back and work in the area more effectively. So not revising them, not changing them, but simply looking to work in very particular sectors where we recognize there are higher rates of work related stress. And we have to remember that the, the basis of the management standards was always about encouraging organizations to assess the risks and put in place reasonable measures to show, um, show practical uh, you know, to show practical measures. So what we want to do is promote but encourage people to do something. Uh, whether or not you use the management standards questionnaire and the analysis tool, it's entirely up to you. But you need to be able to show us if we choose to, if we come into your organisation to say, yes, we did something. We did a risk assessment on the management of stress and uh, and this and this is what we did about it. Um, so I guess that's a, a yes and a, and a cautionary yes. Uh, if, if it, so, uh, but it, it, it's very much about identifying the key sectors and we know where they are. We can tell where the biggest rates of work related stress are. So we will target our resources and effort there. But that doesn't mean we're, gonna, we're not going to also ask the question elsewhere. Okay, great. Um, there's one question relating to something you mentioned earlier about temporary adjustment, um, and that is, uh, as I said, you mentioned uh, temporary adjustment of workload. Uh, is there any guidance on how to judge what is temporary? Well, the, the, there isn't guidance as such. I mean, you can look at um, DWP and the DH's um, uh, guidance on, you know, return to work and that. There's a general opinion that four to six weeks is um, is appropriate for phase return to work, um, only because people are going to be coming back from a state of personal distress. Their their physical and emotional batteries are going to be very very low, and you're actually they, they're going to come in with being slightly anxious. They come into work, so if you throw them straight back into an eight hour day. They probably won't be able to cope, but if you throw them back in and they do two of, you know, two, three, or four hours, and you stage that return, then it's better. Um, no one, because it, it's a it's a recommendation, isn't it? I wouldn't recommend if someone's been off work for three months that you put them straight back into work, because my experience, um, my experience as a psychologist would show that actually people need to recover. But the really important thing here is that you agree with the individual about what they feel that they need to get uh, a return to work. So they might say, actually, boss, you know, I, I reckon I can do it in three weeks. Well, go with three weeks. Or actually, no, I think I need, I need the six weeks. So there isn't that arbitrary number as such. <clears throat> okay, um, there's a couple of questions here, actually, uh, that they are the, basically the same question, and that is, uh, which sectors do you say have the highest rates of work-related stress? Okay, um, health, so that includes hospitals and healthcare, uh, teaching or education, primary and secondary, that's excluding uh, higher education, although they do have their own issues. Um, you've also got public sector and uh, local government and then we still have higher rates in the financial sector the if you look at the um the two primary ones health and education they account for about six percent of, of the cases in work related stress but they also are the biggest employers uh, for for example the the healthcare sector, including the NHS, is the biggest employer. So you know you, um, but there are some unique uh, things that uh, impact there. But if you think about uh, 
both the hospital profession or the, the healthcare and teaching, they're, they're all but their vocational qualifications. So people choose to go into that work for some sense of reward, uh, not necessarily financial, but also, rec you know, uh, that the fact that they're, they're there to help people. And so when you have a, a dis you have a dis disagreement between what's expected of you uh, as a nurse or as a doctor or as a teacher, because you're not able to achieve that, um, it might you may feel stressed, but you will also feel stress because you feel you're failing the teach the kids or you're failing your patients so sometimes in vocational courses what we uh, uh, vocational careers you do see that increase so that's possibly one reason why uh, you do see higher rates um, also they are very 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 uh, difficult jobs with uh, issues that need to be addressed okay brilliant um, well we've uh, we've Come to the uh, end of the hour. Uh, okay. There are still a few questions left, but uh, if you're happy to, what I'll do is I'll make a note of these questions, and perhaps we can look at them uh, and provide written answers uh, shortly. Um, I'm just aware of time, and obviously people probably need to to get back to to their their, their work or, or or go for lunch or something. Um, so, are you happy for me to do that? Yeah, I mean, if it, yeah, absolutely fine. If if there's one killer question that someone wants to ask, then ask it now. And um, um, I think uh, to be, I mean, the one that might be quite useful for people to be aware of is uh, someone has mentioned. Uh, are there any examples of good web pages uh, which support staff health and well-being to reduce workplace stress? Uh, yeah, yeah, there are there are a number of different um, actually national nice have done a report called PH22 which looked at how, uh, mental health and well-being. Um, but there are uh, yeah, so the British Heart Foundation have have, have good stuff on health uh, health and well-being. Uh, the Department of Pensions also has also have, have a web page. There's BITC um, and which is the business in the community have got an excellent resource. NHS Choices also have a good resource. So there's um, what we can do, Ben, is uh, send you a set of links, also CIPD, to these organisations if that would help, and then you could put that somewhere on the, attach it to the end of the slide set, or we could, uh, if that would help people. Yep, certainly. I don't have a problem with doing that. If you want to forward the, all the links over to me, I can uh, let everyone have them. Not a problem at all. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, what I'll do is for those of you who have asked a question, if you haven't had your uh, your answer yet, we will uh, we will review these um, and try and get some written answers um, a bit made available. Um, in the meantime, thank you very much uh, to Peter for for delivering uh, this presentation. Um, I thought it was very interesting. I hope you all found it uh, interesting, and valuable as well. Um, I will shortly be closing the chat room uh, and the webinar, so you're, you'll probably find that your screen will switch off uh, momentarily. Uh, but all that's left to say is thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, a recording of this session has been made and will be put onto the Health and Social Care Group microsite afterwards. I will also be emailing out to all of you the presentation as well as a, a copy of this recording. Um, once again, thank you all very much for attending, and thank you, uh, thank you to Peter for for delivering it. Well, that's my first webinar, so uh, it was uh, it was a good experience. I enjoyed oh, it. Brilliant. I think it went very well, um, and hopefully everyone else felt so too. Um, so uh, that's I mean, if I if any of you see me at a conference, come up and say hello, because uh, um, obviously I'm a psychologist and I like talking to people as well and seeing their faces. So please do. Okay. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. And the session will now close. Take care and bye-bye. Bye-bye.